Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Charles Barron, co-founder of FBN, and welcome to another edition of From the Field, uh, where we uh, try to bring the best stories from around the FBN network uh, of our farmers and now ranchers uh, from around the US, Canada, and Australia uh, to tell folks their stories and what's going on on the farm and the biggest issues facing the farm uh, today. And uh, today, we're very, very excited to be joined by Mike Galloway, uh, who ranches near uh, Gillette, Wyoming. Uh, Mike is uh, known to the world uh, from his R, R Wyoming Life YouTube channel and Instagram channel, where he has a following of uh, hundreds of thousands of, of subscribers who uh, he educates on issues facing the ranch, as well as um, the daily life of a ranch and uh, uh, key issues for managing cattle. Um, so Mike, thank you very much and, and welcome to From the Field. Well, thank you very much, Charles. I appreciate it. It's nice to finally see you in person. I think this is the first time I've ever met face to face or as much as you meet face, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's always uh, fun to, you know, when you meet folks over the phone who you've seen on YouTube so many times, as I have with your channel, because uh, it, uh, it feels like you're, you're, you're talking to someone that you know so well through all the YouTube videos. Uh, and uh, I know that's that's kind of a, a one way relationship because uh, because I felt like I really knew you a, a lot before we uh, fight, we ever uh, talked for the first time. Um, but uh, uh, so so Mike, uh, tell us tell everyone about the the ranch and the ranching business that you guys are are running there because it's it's uh, quite diverse, um, and um, uh, you've got a very interesting story um, both in the ranching business that you're building out and then also how you how you got to the ranch. Yeah, it's been a, it's been kind of a weird. They always say it's been you know it's a weird wild road how we got here and, and literally for us, uh, for my wife and I, uh, it was kind of a, a strange journey. I worked in in radio for years and years and years and that's where I met my wife Erin. Uh, was in the radio business and I was working for a large radio group out of Boston. I had actually risen up as a DJ uh, through management. I was uh, at that time I was an operations manager and uh, vice president within the corporation. So I'm handling multi-million dollar budgets and things like that. And Aaron and I got married and uh, she worked in sales. I was kind of more on the programming side of thing. And in 2008, uh, we got married in June. And by just a couple months after we got married, uh, Aaron's stepdad, who was a rancher in Wyoming and married Aaron's mom while she was in college, uh, had a heart attack. I always say that he had a heart attack when he got the bill for the wedding, which I might not be too far off uh, from the truth, but he ended up, uh, he had a heart attack and, and they called us and they said, hey, uh, Gilbert's not going to be able to take care of the ranch this winter. He's not going to be able to feed. And can, is there any chance you guys can take a sabbatical and come back and help us out on the ranch? And, you know, I said, well, I know nothing about ranching and farming. Uh, I, I, you know, went in the military after high school, uh, worked in radio. I sat at the desk, I, 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 I spun records and, and, and that kind of thing. So I said, well, how hard can this be? You know, we're just gonna go back. We're gonna, I'm gonna learn how to drive a tractor. We're gonna feed cows all winter long. And that's pretty much all we have to do. So we took a short sabbatical, came back to Wyoming. And, uh, and that's where uh, our lives definitely made a different, a, a twist. Uh, we got here and, and we kind of fell in love with it. And uh, we were newlyweds. Uh, there was no there was no farm or no farmhouse on the ranch to live in. So we actually lived in town in, in Aaron's, my wife's uh, parents' basement. So we got up every morning, we came out and fed the cows. And uh, I always joke and say, after I got done feeding cows, I went and watched Netflix because I thought that's all there was to ranching. I just kind of uh, came and did my thing and went home. And then uh, calving rolls around and, and we're still here. And then haying. And then next thing you know, it's the following year and we're doing the same thing all over again. And that's where we really did fall in love with, with, with ranching and, and having the freedom uh, to do what we want to do. And, and we decided this is where we wanted to stay. This is where we wanted to raise our family. And uh, everything else kind of just fell into place from that and, and how we ended up uh, realizing that in some aspects, when you've got a multifamily farm, uh, it's hard to make a living for, for multi, you know, for more than one family to, to make a living. So we decided to start diversifying and Aaron started doing farmers markets and I started uh, working on websites and doing and doing some voiceover work here and there. And, and uh, eventually one day uh, we sat back and we realized that we were doing a whole bunch of different things and we thought, uh, you know, we can we can use YouTube and social media to try to to sell our products at farmers markets. So we were selling beef by that point at farmers market, and we made a short video that we put online, basically showing how we fed our cows. It was a four and a half minute long video, but being able to tap into that radio experience and and show people 
how things worked and, and being able to explain it to anybody. And we, we made this video, woke up the next morning, it had 25,000 views and we had 1500 subscribers to a YouTube channel that we had no idea uh, where we were gonna take. So that was kind of how we got started, uh, you know, on, in farming and ranching, but also uh, taking the next step and being able to educate people. And that's when we realized we had viewers from all over the world, we weren't just gonna be selling them bacon and, and hamburger. Uh, we had to sell them something else. And that idea became where your food comes from and the families behind it. And, and you've really combined the YouTube channel with a direct-to-consumer business, which has been also uh, uh, such a cool uh, pairing. Talk about the farm store that you built and then also the, uh, the mail order business on, 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 uh, on, on beef. Well, I mean, we were doing farmer's markets and we continued doing farmer's markets even when we were doing YouTube. And uh, we realized that we had, you know, we had this worldwide audience and everybody wanted a piece of the ranch. People wanted to come visit. They wanted to buy beef. They wanted to buy pork. And being, we were just kind of limited by farmer's markets. And we said, you know, how hard would it be to open a store on the ranch? So we opened a farm store, a very small little building. It's got some freezers in it and a few racks and that kind of thing. And people can come and buy basically what they could buy at farmer's market here on the ranch. And then uh, we said, well, now, now we're doing that. You know, what can we offer to consumers, you know, all over the U.S.? And, and the easy answer for us was beef jerky. So uh, <laughs> we started taking something that normally, you know, we take cull cows that um, are worth 80 cents a pound if you're lucky and now we can turn them into a three dollar uh, product and and being able to do things that that we can you know basically take almost waste on the ranch and being able to turn that into a value-added product and that's really what uh, youtube has allowed us to do is take um, the ranch and turn it into a value-added product and and whether we're educating or selling uh, a physical item from the ranch it's all it's all something that you wouldn't normally take from a ranch. It's a different, it's a different business plan. We had accountants scratching their heads for quite a few years saying, uh, how do we deal with all this? This is different, this is new. So with the beef jerky, how do you, uh, how do you get it uh, processed and um, you know, how do you handle slaughter and uh, processing and, and, then, uh, and then get it uh, distributed out to your customers? Well, we lucked, we lucked out uh, when, when we first started doing beef, uh, we knew that we wanted to have it done safely. And, you know, there's different types of inspection processes you can have. You can have state inspected, you can have USDA inspected. And we decided that we wanted to be able to offer our customers that bought beef from us the best that we possibly could. So there's actually a USDA inspected facility in Sturgis, South Dakota. So we were able to take steers originally over there. Uh, we would get everything processed and sent back to us. And that would allow us to sell uh, prepackaged beef so we could sell somebody just a t-bone we didn't have to sell halves and holes and quarters we didn't have to sell shares and all that kind of good stuff we could just sell the average consumer a t-bone just like they could in the grocery store so that actually led us into beef jerky which we knew that if we were going to be shipping beef jerky all over the u.s it had to be usda inspected so right. really it was a very simple transition all we did was we went to sturgis and we said hey can you make us beef jerky and they said well yeah we should we can do that and we'll figure out how to do it and and, and the funny thing is like we're able to help uh, meat packers move along in their process as well. So we, we have a demand for a Slim Jim type product. So now they're working on getting the equipment to make that. Huh. And your viewers are probably all over the world, but I'm sure all over the US. And, and have you seen the sales come in that way in terms of the geographies that people are buying and supporting the channel from? Oh yeah. We see it from everywhere. We ship, uh, we ship everything directly out of our house. Aaron and I actually pack the boxes and send it out. And uh, it's, it's amazing. It's cool to see uh, where it's going. You know, this one's going to Hawaii. This one's going to Pennsylvania. This one's going to uh, an APO address in, 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 you know, the Middle East somewhere. I mean, it's just amazing what people will do with it. Right. And, and in the, uh, you also do a whole lot of education on the farm, which is really great. And uh, I know in the pre-COVID, era and and then hopefully then this year um you're hosting the event again uh things get back to normal but i'm um, talking about the uh, the gathering that you do every year uh, on the ranch and and the folks who turn out for that well like i said before everybody always wants a piece of the ranch and everybody and one of the and one of those things is people will stop by we have people come and knock on the door occasionally and just want to talk and and we thought well you know we can we can start doing something once a year that we call the ranch roundup and basically, it's a three-day event that we throw here on the ranch. People come um, from all over the U.S. The first year we did it, pre-COVID days, uh, we had all, uh, we had, let me see, 
almost all 50 states and, and seven different provinces in Canada that were actually represented. People traveled here wow. uh, to see us. And we invite our the people that we work with on the channel, whether it's equipment manufacturers or service providers, we invite them to come along as well. Um, and then they get a chance to talk directly to our to our subscribers. And we film the whole thing and we do a virtual event along with it. And it's all about just bringing people closer to where their food comes from. And it's about being advocates for agriculture. Um, a lot of people, you know, sometimes don't want to uh, put their face out there. So we say, well, we'll, we'll do that for you. And, and you, can, you can live vicariously through us. And, but everybody wants people to know where their food comes from. And uh, if you can walk up and, and this is something we told people all the way back when we were doing farmer's markets was that if you can talk to a farmer if you could talk to them about where their food comes from and how important it is that they grow safe food for you and you know that they wouldn't do anything to jeopardize their own family why would they do that to jeopardize your your family um, and if you have a chance to talk to them uh, it takes away a lot of that misconception and the fear that people have uh, about um, livestock or even growing practices and and where your food comes from and, and it's, it just brings people down to earth and almost takes back a hunt to a farmer and now if you talk to people uh they always say well my grandpa my grandpa was a farmer or my grandpa raised cows or my great grandpa and, and everybody seems so dis detached from it and i we want to bring that back we want to give some some people uh, a place to come home to and are they are people uh camping out are they bringing rvs is this uh you know what kind of is this a <laughs> full jamboree or how, how do you manage the crowds on the uh, on the ranch <laughs> If we let people camp out on the ranch, I'm sure they would. Uh, we tend to, we, we actually went to town and we, we set up a hotel in town so that okay. people could stay there at that hotel. And then in order, and then we also do a, a live event from the hotel usually, um, a, like a live stream where people come and sit in the audience and, and we bring up guests and people that have been in, on the show that year or hunters or, you know, funny, we bring back funny items that have happened and that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's if, if you let people come and stay on the ranch, I'm sure people would just have a tent out there and, and be ready to go. But um, we do, we like our, our privacy as well. So there's right. there's definitely a line that you want to draw. Some people may not want to leave if you have free camping. Uh, and, That's true and, uh, too. I've had that happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, well, I mean, you're really a, a, a tremendous educator uh, on uh, on farming and ranching issues, Mike. And that's one of the things I really love about the channel. And I'm sure it's why uh, you, you've built such a big following. Um, but, you know, because because on the channel, you really uh, get into a lot of detailed issues uh, around farm economics, ranch economics. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's just showing the work that's being done on a daily basis, breaking ice, moving cattle, selling cattle, uh, really showing people a day in the life. And that's that's one of the things I think that really helps communicate uh, to folks what it actually means uh, for someone uh, to be a rancher and to be working on a ranch. What, what's the job like? I know you have a lot of folks who reach out to you about what does it take to get started in ranching. And Definitely. one of my favorite videos you made was around uh, cattle economics and the economics of ranching, uh, because I think um, that can be sort of a black box for a lot of people and not really doing the math right, not doing the numbers right. Um, what, are, what are some of the lessons that you've learned uh, through that education in terms of the types of things, the types of common questions or issues that, that ranchers have um, that you think uh, folks really need to have better education on? I think a lot of the education that we offer to others was something that I had to learn by, by myself. Uh, my right. father-in-law, who who brought us to the ranch, uh, by his his health kept on failing. Uh, he passed away in 2012, and then we were here uh, on our own. So what we wanted to do um, was get people thinking about the cost that goes into it. And you know, dealing with multi-million-dollar budgets and radio, there was no way I could just say, "Hey, we just spent this much money, and we'll figure out how to make it back later." to justify every cent that comes in and every cent that goes out. And so that's where we really started sitting down. And I know that people have been doing it, you know, for years and years and years, but figuring out how much a cow costs to be on the ranch. And that was kind of our very first uh, venture into the economics of it, because we had a lot of people asking us about it. It's tricky to make a video about without saying, hey, here's my, take a look at it and figure out for yourself. So, and there's so many different variables that people have to deal with as well. You know, you're, where you're at, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the location that you farm or ranch, the type of cows you have, there's so many different things, but being able to break it down to exactly how much does that cow cost you per year and how much you can sell or calf for, that's what it comes down to. And if you can, and if you can make that work for you, um, then you have to figure out if it's worth it. 
Uh, if you have a, a cow that costs $800 a year to keep and you're only selling cows for $800 or $900, uh, you know, an entire herd of 100 cows is only making you $10,000 for an entire year. Okay. And you blow a tire on a tractor and there goes your entire profit margin. So being able to know exactly where every dime that you have going in um, is, is huge. And another thing we wanted to really tell people was that, uh, you know, the most important business is yourself. So if you, whatever you have to do to be able to make it work for you, um, you're going to have to figure out how to do that. And you have to figure out if that's what you want to do. And it's, it's been a, an inter interesting road because a lot of people don't, uh, you know, or haven't sat down and actually ran the numbers. And you start looking at stocking rates and stuff like that. And it's, uh, you realize how important it is. Once you start doing it, uh, you wonder why you didn't do it 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, and it also speaks to diversifying the business uh, and giving yourself, um, you know, other markets. And you've done that through Consumer Direct and you've done that through through YouTube as well, um, which can become an income stream unto itself. Um, and, and um Mike, well, you know, you know, with what you've uh, seen in ranching today and, and the ways in which you've been evolving the business, um, what do you see right now as the biggest challenges, you know, facing uh, ranchers, whether they're in the U.S. or Canada or, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, what are the biggest challenges in the cattle markets right now? I think that one of the biggest challenges is that we don't value ourselves enough. We don't say that we're that important. I think, and it, it sounds like a huge ego thing, and I'm going to, you know, run around saying, hey, we, we produce the food that, that you eat, and, you know, that makes us important, but a lot of times, I, I think that people kind of forget that, so when you start t talking about going and selling a calf for, and scraping by and barely making a profit on that calf, you, you got to look at that and say, maybe there's a better way for me to make money on the ranch, and maybe not do what grandpa did or what my dad did. It's, it's hard to change, but that's one of our biggest uh, obstacles that we face is change. So having, having the courage to actually say, hey, we're going to do something different. Trust me, doing YouTube and social media and all this other stuff has been a challenge since, since day one. And not only just because it's hard to put yourself out there and hard to talk in front of a camera and try to remember what you're going to say, but also you have other farmers and ranchers standing in the background saying, this guy's crazy. There's, or, or, or he's giving away the, the family secrets. We don't want him to tell, you know, what how hard it is or how, you know, how this works or how that works. And some of the, the most criticism I get comes from other farmers and ranchers. It's sad, but it is true because it's, it's a, it's a, it's a touchy subject to actually get into, but change is going to happen uh, whether we like it or not. And you can ride that wave or you can let it roll over you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, you know, the, the last 10 years have been uh, challenging for both uh, row crop farmers in the commodities and in the, and in the cattle business, especially you've had, uh, weak prices uh, and uh, you know the the, the fed cattle uh, spread between uh, fed cattle and the, uh, the the box beef price has you know continued to expand. So obviously that's something that frustrates a whole lot of uh, ranchers out there. Um, and what are what are you looking forward to in, in terms of you know the future of the business, future of the ranch? You know where where do you see the uh, you know where do you see the future uh, going for uh, uh, being a Wyoming ranch? I, I think I think we're going to continue to diversify. I think things, you know, opportunities are going to come up and deciding whether or not to grab those opportunities. Uh, that's kind of a trick. Sometimes we've had uh, companies approach us about uh, having a, a kind of like a resort type situation here on the ranch where people can come and stay in RVs and experience the ranch life for themselves, come out and help fix fence and stuff like that. We've looked at, at doing things like that. Uh, my biggest goal is to be an advocate for agriculture. Uh, people ask me if I see myself making videos in 10 years. I kind of hope not. I hope that we can move up that, that ladder to, you know, doing speaking events and everything kind of when everything gets back to normal and, and we're able to go out and, and do it in person because that's where you really make the impact. You can make videos, um, but when you go out and you actually get in people's face and you start explaining to them what's happening and why it's happening, uh, then, then that's when it really seems to strike home. So I see the future of our Wyoming life just be, just growing and becoming more of an influence uh, in agriculture, becoming advocates and helping others uh, do the same and having have, helping others have the courage to step up and be advocates for their industry as well. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, that's one of the you know great things about the channel is, you know, the number of things that you guys have been educating on. And I've learned a ton uh, from the channel, sometimes about the very basics of, of ranching and and uh, also just, uh, I think it's fascinating for everybody to see uh, what it actually takes to raise cattle. Well, well, Mike, um, you know, in, in closing, what, would, what, what do you think the most important things that you would like 
uh, consumers to know about, you know, where their food's coming from and, and the folks who are producing it. Um, and uh, what, you know, what have, what kinds of messages have you uh, been really wanting to convey uh, to folks who've, who've either been interested in uh, learning more about ranching or, or just, uh, you know, don't, don't know what it's all about? You know, the biggest thing is, is learn as much as you can. Make up your own mind. Uh, people tend to believe what they're told. And we are, we're given thousands of resources to go out and learn for yourself. Um, you can read an article and you can go Google that article that, you know, 10 minutes later and find out if it's true or not. Uh, there's, there's so many different ways for people to learn uh, what's happening. So I, you know, my biggest thing is that to, for people to keep on learning and realize that it is mom and dad and kids right. that are supplying our food. 95% of ranches in the U.S. are still family, family owned, even though the largest 5% are the ones that are putting out the most. But when you're talking about family owned farms, it's still mom and dad and grandpa and it's generations that have been here and how important it is that they're here and that people can care so much. Uh, that was my biggest thing when we came here. Uh, I didn't really get it for a few years. I, you know, Gilbert loved this place. My father-in-law, he loved this place more than anything. He had to come out every single day and, and tinker around on his gator. And it used to drive me crazy because I was like, what is this guy doing? He's not accomplishing anything, but he was here. <laughs> and he loved this land more than anything. And it's hard to believe that you can have a connection to something like that. And so that's what farmers and ranchers have is a connection um, to the land and to your food. And how important it is to them is just as important as how it is to you. And you're just as important to them as well. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, big circle that we right. all live in. And I think that if we can connect each other more, there's this huge disconnect. We have producers and we have consumers. And it seems like for years we've been growing apart. One good thing that's come out of COVID, if anything, is that a bunch of people went to the grocery store and saw there was empty shelves right. and said, what happened? And then they started thinking for themselves and they said, hey, wait, a minute, something's not right here. And so if we can learn anything from the last year, that would be it, that we need to care about where our food comes from. And it needs to be important to us. And, and we need to be able to educate ourselves on that. Yeah, I think it's, it's one of the, the things that, you know, is the biggest misconceptions in agriculture is people see a big commodity system or they see, uh, you know, big acre operations and they assume it's this faceless anonymous system that is producing their food and it's not not it is it is thousands and thousands of uh, family-run uh, farms and ranches uh, in rural America and, and they're the, the core economic uh, engine of, of our rural communities as well and, and uh, people uh, you know need to understand that there's there's real stories and families uh, behind that food uh, and where their food is coming from and we encourage everyone to check out uh, our Wyoming life and, and the channel uh, if you want to learn more about uh, what being a rancher is all about uh, it is a phenomenal resource uh, and it's a great way to learn about uh, cattle and, and the life of ranching uh, and uh, all kinds of topics that you guys have, have put out videos about um, and uh, certainly encourage everyone uh, where, where can they go to uh, to uh, sample the uh, sample the jerky uh, well you head to our website rwyomilife.com it's all there uh, on the website uh, there's packages where you can test you know test drive different flavors uh, we've got uh, pepper, teriyaki. I mean, we've got tons of different flavors that you can try. Uh, we've even experimented with some crazy flavors that didn't work, uh, but <laughs> we definitely have some different flavors ready to try. And if you go to the website, rwomilife.com, then you can find where else to find us, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, all that kind of good stuff. It's a good central place to, to hang out. We also have cameras uh, on the ranch, web cameras on the ranch that if you want to watch the cows, some people amaze me that they just sit and watch the cows all day. And, and I've got a friend of mine that lives in New Jersey who I met through the channel uh, that he's got one monitor on his desk that just shows the ranch all day long. And uh, he can watch the cows eat and, and do whatever they're doing. So uh, that's his way to connect, but everybody's going to find their own way to connect back with their roots and where their food comes from. So that's definitely one way to do it. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks so much, Mike. Uh, and uh, for everyone, again, Mike Galloway from Our Wyoming Life. Uh, please go uh, check out the channel and support, support the farm uh, however you can. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank hope you. Hope to see you again in, in a person uh, when this is all, things are a little more back to normal. <laughs> Eventually. Thank you, sir. All right. See you, Mike. <laughs>